Welcome to China in Focus. I'm Tiffany Meyer. In this next part of our exclusive special series with Michael Sikora, founder and director of the Socrates Project within the Reagan White House, we zoom in on whether the U.S. has a military competitive advantage over China. Following the recent shootdowns of a Chinese spy balloon and three mystery objects, talks of a hot war and how each side is shaping up are dominating headlines. Mike, thank you so much for joining us. Great to have you back on the show. Uh, my pleasure, as always. So last time we were talking about the inevitability of a hot war between the U.S. and China. But I'm curious how we got here and how the two countries are stacking up right now. Does one side have a bigger military advantage, for example? Uh, that's a good question, and it's a very complex question, Okay, as always, right? Because that's one of the things, when it comes to China, it's very, very complex. And that's one of the things that people don't understand. We're used to measuring it in simple terms. And actually, that's one of the things that's gotten, gotten the United States into problems with China. Okay. As, as talking just, first of all, just from a military, well, not just from a military, but mainly from a military perspective, over the last several years, DOD and the decision makers have shifted how they've defined competitive advantage. Okay, in terms of, you know, in many cases it's number of ships, or, for example, it's we they don't have any uh, aircraft carriers. We've got several aircraft carriers, so in so in the oceans we've got the competitive advantage. But then it's like, well, they got an aircraft carrier, so it's not just if they've got an aircraft carrier; it's how many they've got. Well. They've got quite a few now, we're almost matching us. So it's not just that, it's what we've got on the aircraft carrier. That's one of the things about technology strategy and strategy in general in many cases, is you continue to convince the adversary, reinforce that you're not that much of a threat. And from a US perspective, backing down on what that threat is and redefining it as a way to save face, to stay comfortable, and things like that. Let me give you an example out of the economics, commercial sector, which is very classic of this. It's classic of how China is operating in this respect, is that General Motors, the US auto manufacturer. If you look at a US auto manufacturer, let's take GM, my family have been there for three generations. The profit levels are significantly greater the higher you go up. So if you look at a very subcompact car, it's a couple percent. Okay. You look at a Corvette or a big Cadillac, it's like 10, 15, 20 percent. And when you look at the accessories, it's a massive markup. So if you look at how the US auto industry lost, it's when foreign players came in and said, you know what? We're just going to produce these small little tin cans. Nobody wants them. And GM said, look, if you're dumb enough to produce it, we're smart enough to let you have it because our profit margins are so slow, so little. OK. But then those little cans become a little more sophisticated, eat up a little more of the market. And GM, of course, and this comes from family history that I know, they still made that argument. Well, you know, it's the boiling frog routine, right? Well, it's a little thing, whatever. So before you know it, now they've eaten all the way up into, as China has done in the commercial sector, all the way to the exotics and things like that. So now GM has got competition across the board. But in each case, GM redefined what was a competitive advantage, which from their perspective was financially making their numbers. And every time the boil, the water and the temperature for the frog got a little bit hotter, uh, they redefined it of, well, you know, we don't, but we make the big monies up here, so we'll just restructure a little bit. We'll still make our numbers. Same thing with China. Uh, we have continued to redefine competitive advantage such that we could continue to view China as a non-threat, number one. And still, for many, many years, up until just recently, and still some people are in this camp that, you know what, China's going to be democratic any moment. They're going to be a free market. Just give them some more time, whatever. So that's the first problem. Second problem was that the U.S. intel community, intelligence community, continued, continued to 
misjudge, misestimate China's progression. So for example, for years it was maintained at one point in time that um, China wouldn't have an aircraft carrier for five years. Poof, they had one. Okay. So time and time again, first with aircraft carriers, then with stealth bombers, then with advanced fighter jets, it was always that they weren't going to have it for so many years, and all of a sudden that so many years just got shortened down. So they went from we had superiority in all these various categories of Army, Navy, Air Force in the equipment, so all of a sudden that we have the advantage and it's going to have for 10 years, 5 years, and oh, went to zero. So in so many of these cases, they've matched us. If you look at so many of the debates going on on how we address a hot war with China, it comes from a, from a premise which doesn't make a lot of sense, which is that we do have a competitive advantage. So if you look at various players coming out of the think tanks, if you look at some of the people in SecDef's office, there's an assumption we have a competitive, we have a military competitive advantage. So the only argument is how are we going to deploy that? So do we put a couple ships in the, uh, in the sea between uh, Taiwan and China and just as a minor deterrence? Or do we put a whole ton of ships in there for a, not just a deterrence, but for in preparation of engagement. But in each case, every one of these assumes that we have a competitive advantage. And as we talked before in the previous episode, China, number one, is generating competitive advantage from the technology space. Well, we're not, we're just in the money side, okay? Number two, they are continuing to generate increasing competitive advantage in more and more areas, if we talk military, Army, Navy, Air Force, okay? And they're not going to engage until they do have the competitive advantage and they know it. Zooming in on the part on how the intelligence agency seems to have been misjudging uh, China's rise in all these different areas, does it come down to, say, the definitions or just looking at the wrong factors? Or how do we make sure we start getting that right? The way the Americans see the way the game is played in competition when it comes to technology is that it is a basically an R&D foot race. Okay? Put in simple terms, what that means is both sides, uh, the, 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 quote, the correct way to compete is both sides identify their targets, okay? And the Americans say, well, if you're smart, you're gonna have the same targets we do because that's what dictates the future competitiveness, right? So the, the targets are quantum AI, you know, the big magical ones. And then the way the, ga the game is played is that once you've identified the targets, you go to the laboratory, you put the laboratory researchers to work, you give them a lot of money, preferably more money than the other guy, China, and then they put on their blinders and rush to the finish line to get the breakthrough first, okay? But that's not what China's doing. But yet, if you look at Army Futures Command and things like that, they're from the premise that basically we're in an R&D foot race. He who gets the, the breakthrough first wins, number one, and the way to get the breakthrough first is spend more money than the other side. So if China, if we spend a billion dollars and you know, China spends $1.5 billion and we're gonna increase our money to $2 billion and get the finish line first. But as we've talked about, China is engaging in a game of worldwide technology, offensive, defensive, exploitation chess. So they're exploiting technology in a very fluid, dynamic way. As we talked about, they got 30 years of putting all these paths in place worldwide to acquire the technology they need, to acquire all the other resources they need, and to put the influence in place, okay? So they're playing this very adroit game of technology exploitation, exploitation chess that they're drawing from everybody worldwide. 
we're from the premise that basically it's an R&D foot race and we got to sit here and just, you know, buckle down in the lab a little bit harder, give them a little more money. So if China is drawing from everybody in the world, offensively and defensively, which means they can acquire what they need and they can block us from acquiring what we need, okay, from an, an ally or something like that, and we're sitting mainly with indigenous development with a little bit of, maybe we'll talk a little bit with our NATO allies, and their paths include pulling from us, how can we win? Because they're pulling from everybody, including us. We're doing things almost in, indigenously. So now it comes to the intel community. They're, they're basically estimating from the same premises that it's an R&D foot race, we look at what the capabilities are, what they should have in 5, 20 years, and it's not that much. But what they're not taking into consideration, they know that China, you know, they've got a little here, they've got a little bit here, but they don't understand and take into consideration this massive chess game that's going on that has its tentacles in every corner of the world, and that's what's enabled them to field a, um, an aircraft carrier five years sooner than uh, the entire intelligence community estimated they would. That's happened time and time and time again, because they're looking at the core is R&D. Look at their R&D. Well, they dabble around the edges with a little bit of theft, but it's the core. No, and the other thing is, as we talked about before, theft is a small, small portion of what they do in their acquisition requirement maneuvers. You've got that full range from licensing, gray market, uh, acquisition by law when you go into China, all that full range of ways. But the U.S. intel community will tend to look at, okay, what China does is indigenous development with theft towards the high tech, and that's about it. But again, full range of mechanisms of acquisition in a mosaic of direct and indirect paths, and they're looking at high tech to low tech to medium tech. That is how they're able to hoodwink the intel community time and time again. That was Michael Sikora, founder and director of the Socrates Project within the Reagan White House. And after the break, we continue our exclusive special coverage with him on how China has been catching up in terms of numbers and what that means in terms of war readiness. Our full episode is available on our partner platform, Epoch TV. To sign up, click the link down below. Thanks for watching China in Focus. I'm Tiffany Meyer. See you soon.